So after my last video about the PDUs, uh, the fire hazard one and the really good one from CyberPower, practically everyone was telling me I should do more videos about power strips and PDUs. And by practically everyone, I mean absolutely no one. But here I am again, because what the internet needs is one more video about UPSs and power strips and whatever the hell this is. So that's where we are today. And I'm going to look at these three power distribution units. I don't know, you might want to call them power strips or surge protectors or some or all the above. I mean, this is a strip. This is really more of a rectangle, as is this. So the nomenclature-wise, everyone seems to just call these power strips or surge protectors. I would think they're a subset of PDUs or power distribution units. Whatever you want to call them, they're these. You know what they are. So I'm going to start with the most basic of all of them. This, which isn't in a box because it's old and I've had it for a while, it's a simple six receptacle power strip, uh, the kind you can get from Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever for like uh, $5, I don't know, $6. Um, it's, it's, ra it's rather flimsy and uh, not necessarily trustworthy for high loads or a uh, constant service life. Now that being said, I mean, it's, uh, it's not bad, it works fine. So I'm gonna see what's inside of this and then take a look at what's inside of this guy and this one. Now this is from Furman, which is a relatively reputable brand for power distribution, mostly in the sound and video industry. Uh, this is Belkin, I'm sure you've heard of Belkin. They make all sorts of crap. I'm not even sure if they themselves make it or whether they just white label it. I mean, Belkin label it off a white label. But at any rate, they make a lot of uh, power strips, network cables and all sorts of other computer gear. Um, not necessarily the most reputable brand in all cases, but I have a few of these type of power strips and I actually like them. So uh, that's why I ended up with these. And I got both of these for pretty good deals. Um, yeah, if we're talking about price, this one typically goes for about, like I said, six, ten dollars I don't know, it's not expensive at all. This one I think typically goes for something like 50 bucks. Um, I don't wanna get too detailed on price because it really fluctuates. I think I got this on sale for about 30, which is a good deal for what it is. This usually retails for about 30. I think I got this on eBay really cheap. I got a three pack of these from a liquidation company for like 30 bucks for three of them. So they were $10 a piece. That's an amazingly good deal. I wouldn't go looking for that kind of deal because I mean, I was surprised I got this. It was a bidding auction and you know, I just got really lucky that no one else came in. But uh, yeah, so the goal here is just to see what makes a quality power distribution unit and why you should pay the extra money for something that costs $30 or $50 as opposed to something that costs six or ten dollars and I think really what it comes down to is a safety issue it's not so much that these are going to electrocute you or cause you any sorts of problems directly but it's a fire hazard issue it's an electrical safety issue um, in general and I'm not saying this is a fire hazard or this is necessarily dangerous it's just not as well made I'm guessing as the other two and that's what I'm here to explore so let's take this journey together um, yeah, this one is really not much to talk about, not much to see. Uh, the one thing that's good about this and most any, you know, listed and sort of a certified product, it has a nice thick cord, which should be, I'm guessing, 14 gauge because this is rated for 15 amps. Um, ah, yeah. And it says it right there. Sometimes it's just hard to find the markings. Uh, you might not be able to see it, but it certainly says 14 gauge. And that's the first thing you want to look at when it comes to any kind of power strip or power distribution unit. Uh, some extension cords, for example, are 16 gauge. They're not rated for a full 15 amps, which is what most uh, receptacles in your household are going to be rated at, because that's what the circuit breaker on the other end is rated at. If this cord's less than 14 gauge and you're running 15 amps through it, that could be a problem. And it's very easy to overload these because they have so many receptacles on them. And that's kind of why they end up being dangerous, because people don't know what the draw is of things they're plugging into it so they can easily overload it by accident. Now the first thing you'll note about this Furman is that it's made of metal. I mean it's a metal case all the way around and that's usually a very good thing because if anything overheats or melts down inside 
it won't uh, melt down on the outside. It, and if there's a fire inside the unit, it won't spread to the outside. Whereas with a plastic power distribution unit, if it starts overheating, this case is just gonna melt away and expose the electrodes and potentially uh, expose your carpeting or flooring to heat. Now this it would do the same, but the metal provides more protection against the heat for whatever's surrounding it. So metal is usually a better thing to buy when it comes to these, uh, when it comes to power strips. Another advantage metal has over plastic is that plastic can be brittle, especially if you expose it to UV light, if you leave it by a window or something. Um, these can become very brittle and just sort of have pieces snap off. Plus, if it's on the floor, you might step on it, you might drop something on it. If it breaks open, it's going to expose the electrodes beneath, which I'll show you, and uh, why that's so obviously a danger, because there's going to be bus bars running right through this with uh, full line voltage. And so if this breaks, you could electrocute yourself, uh, shock yourself, a child could crawl up to it, touch it, and uh, yeah, overall bad news. Metal, more likely to bend than to break. So uh, while well, it might cause other kinds of problems, uh, if, this gets, if something gets dropped on this, it might bend, might short something out internally, but it's not going to shock or electrocute you, most likely. The other thing you'll notice about this, which is not that common except in higher quality, power distribution units is that it has separate receptacle units. Like these receptacles are not part of the case like they are on this one. Like on this one, they're just molded in. This, these are actually discrete components. And usually that means that these are a higher quality than just whatever's, you know, below these molded uh, inserts. They'll probably stand up to higher abuse. They'll probably have more tension on the pins. In fact, yeah, that's pretty good. Like it's difficult to pull something out by accident or have something fall out. They'll usually give a better connection overall and they're, therefore be less prone to overheating. Um, this also has a, an integral circuit breaker on the switch, which even this cheap guy does. But it also has EMI, RFI, and surge suppression. <coughs> which, uh, I mean, take that with a grain of salt. Even cheap power strips sometimes say uh, surge suppression. The quality of the surge suppression can also be an issue. Not something I'm too concerned with. I mean, just get yourself a whole house surge, suppress surge suppressor if you're worried about that. Um, but realistically, nine times out of 10, anything valuable that I have running off of a power strip, I will have a UPS in front of it anyway, which will provide probably better power protection than any of these things. So uh, anyway, just uh, my two cents on that. Now this Belkin, right away, it's, it's very light. Like the Furman has some weight to it because it's made of metal and because it has these discrete receptacles. This uh, feels a little flimsier. I'm not saying it is flimsy. Like I said, I kind of like these units, but they're not exactly as high quality as this. Now one reason this has an advantage, of course, over these other two styles is that you can put a couple of wall wart style power supplies into this without having to worry about taking up too many extra receptacles. Uh, this also has protection, and I like this. It has a ground indication LED, which not a lot of power strips have, and that'll show you if there's a ground fault. So if the ground pin is floating, that should light up. Just a nice to have, not a necessity, but uh, it'll help you to know that your stuff's not grounded, whereas otherwise you might have no way of knowing offhand without testing it specifically. This also has, um, surge and maybe spike protection, I'm not sure, uh, for phone lines, which I think this is an older model because, I mean, who uses phone lines nowadays? Uh, usually a modern one will have uh, Ethernet connections on there and maybe even uh, coax connections for cable TV or internet data. So that's about all we can learn on the outside. Now I'm going to take these apart and flash forward to see what's on the inside. Ooh. And I'm just now noticing that this Belkin, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see it, has triangular screw heads. So I'm hoping, I have a triangular bit, but I don't know that I'll have one that can get deep enough in there because that's a fairly deep recess. In fact, you can probably see it better there. That kind of sucks. Um, uh, this one just uses Phillips screws on the back and uh, this one Phillips screws on the sides. So no problem to open those up. This one may be an issue, we'll see. Well, that was, as the French would say, a complete f***ing disaster. Oh, not a disaster, but um, yeah, scratch that other Belkin power strip. I'm gonna, look at, I'm gonna look at this one instead, which is very similar, but just an older model of that uh, same unit. The difference being that this one has security screws like that, but they're not recessed quite so much, and it has regular Phillips screws at either end. 
Now, the trouble with the other one was it had triangle screws and I have triangular bits here in my uh, security bits case. But uh, these would not fit into the recesses because uh, their shafts are plenty small right there, but obviously then they widen out. So no good. Um, I should have drivers for these type of screws. And like I said, those are very shallow. So should be okay in this case. Let me get these open finally and uh, yeah, I'll show them to you. I just wanted to explain why this one suddenly changed color and type. By the way, speaking of random screwdrivers and bits and needing to get at screws that are hard to get to, um, somehow I don't have any Phillips drivers that can get at these screws because they're too deep in there. Um, but I have this screwdriver, which is from my grandfather. It's probably 80 years old. Uh, it's got a wood handle and it's a metal, uh, whatever the hell that thing's called. But it's a flathead that's been worn down weirdly, but it's been worn down in such a way that it perfectly grasps Phillips screws of a certain size. Like it hits, like see, not even stripping at all. It goes wonderfully into the heads of these screws and brings them right out. Um, absolutely a great little tool. Don't know where I'd be without it. Thanks, Grandpa. You're welcome. All right, so here we are. And I guess you can kind of see where the cost difference is, at least as far as complexity goes. This is obviously the cheapest of the power strips. And it really just consists of the incoming wires, let me get in close there, um, coming through this cable. The hot uh, or live leg comes out into the switch slash, cir slash circuit breaker, and then continues on to this bus bar on this side. Then the grounding wire comes in, goes straight to this bus bar in the middle with a big blob of solder on there, and goes all the way up to the other end. And then same with the neutral, only the neutral hits the switch first, which I think is just to light the front of it, which is probably, uh... which is probably not an LED. Um, it's, uh, yeah. The point is, that's how it's wired, very, very simply, just straight out of these bus bars. And most cheap power strips have basically the same construction, just a couple of very flimsy bus bars. I mean, look at this. I know it's hard to judge uh, strength just by watching a video, but uh, you could tell this is flimsy metal. These are a little thicker, uh, a little less bendy, but um, yeah, not great. And let me just show you real quick when, what happens when you plug something in. There are um, posts on the back of it that actually retain these from popping out. But without those, I kind of have to hold back on it myself. But as the plug comes through, you can see the prongs come through there. The grounded prong is just hitting the little bent out parts of metal there and pushing through. And the two tines of the plug are basically just going between the two sides of this bus bar. You can see how it's sort of bent out like that, creating a little pocket. Well, that's where the plug goes, into that little pocket. Um, nothing terribly wrong with that. It's just uh, over time, these can loosen up fairly easily. Not that other types of receptacles can't. There's nothing really specifically wrong with this design. Um, but uh, you can see why it's so cheap. It's very easy to manufacture. It's just basically three strips of metal and some wire and a switch. Not much to it at all. As for the Belkin, and like I said, this isn't the exact one I was showing you at the beginning of the video, but it has all the same features. It has surge suppression. It has a ground uh, indicator lamp and a very similar layout overall. So probably very similar construction to the one I was going to show you. Now this is very similar in the sense that it has bus bars. Slightly different construction on the bus bars though. Let me see if I can pull this one out. So this has a strip, but then it has these parts which are bent out and then upwards. And the plug actually, see it's fluted there at the end, the plug will actually push through, the, through there and they spread. This has the advantage that it gets better surface contact with the plug. You see you have two full strips of metal on either side getting fairly good contact right there. Whereas with these little strips, 
you're not seeing quite as much surface area between the prongs of the plug and the bus bar. So in theory, this should have a higher current carrying capacity in that sense. And also these will probably take longer to wear out and loosen up. But again, very flimsy metal. I mean, you can see how easily it can bend. It's uh, also not very thick, as you can see. Um, I'm not a metallurgist, so I can't tell you what metals these are. I'm guessing some kind of alloy, probably similar to brass. It's probably got some copper in there, given it the color. But uh, it's definitely not straight aluminum, which would be absolutely terrible, because it's because aluminum is fairly brittle and eventually it would probably just break. Oh, this is very interesting, actually. These bus bars, you can see it has positions for one, two, three, four, five plugs. But on the front, there's actually only three receptacles there because they're not using two of them. Two of them just kind of dead end into these uh, little supports. So I don't know, that's, that's interesting because just with a few extra holes cut into the front of this, you could actually plug in considerably more items. You wouldn't have the good spacing here that allows you to plug in wall wart power adapters, but uh, yeah, you could actually get four extra sockets out of this by just uh, making some holes in the right place or some slots in the right place. And in the middle here, it uses the same type of bus bar that the cheaper power strip did. It's almost exactly the same uh, form where it's just one strip with a portion stamped and bent out here and uh, the plug goes in quite the same way. In fact, the cheap one actually seems to have better holding, um, a little more tension, a little more friction for when the plug is coming in and out than this does. So uh, yeah, the middle of this Belkin is the same as a cheap power strip, which is not all that endearing to me. This also has coax, uh, which the other one did not, but this one has coax surge suppression, I think. Um, it's obviously a sealed module here. It's this little can. I'm not going to open that up. And I don't really care because honestly, I mean, who really hooks these up? And if this isn't high enough quality, the kind of frequencies that you need on a modern cable connection for data and for uh, HDTV, um, this might actually not pass some of those frequencies or cause uh, interference or intermittent connections. Um, not necessarily the best thing to put in line from a signal quality perspective but it is grounded, it's, bo it's bonded to this bus bar. And this uh, right here, I should point out, is another telephone, I know it's a lot of focus, but you got three phone jacks there. It's another telephone style uh, surge suppression module. It's got a fuse in there, which is kind of interesting, uh, which I guess would stop any major overcurrent issues. It also has maybe a metal oxide varistor, not 100% sure. I'm not really going to get into the quality of the surge suppression for a couple of reasons. One, I'm not Big Clive, and this, that's not my area of expertise. And two, because that's not really what this video is about, I just kind of want to show you what the major differences are between these styles of power strips. This looks uh, like it might... Oh, this is heat staked on. No, it's not. Okay, I'm, I am going to take this module off just so you can see the circuitry. And if it is your area of expertise, you can make a judgment for yourself as to the quality. This is kind of going to require moving some of these bus bars out of the way. But there you go. Wow, it's got a lot of, uh, I don't know, nylon sleeving. I doubt it's nylon. Nylon would melt at a very low temperature. It's got some kind of sleeving around. Ah. Honestly, I don't know what those are because they're in square packages and they're orange. Um, I'll look them up. I'll Put, uh, they have a code here. I'll put that on the screen so you can see what I'm talking about. Looks like it also has a thermistor or some kind of other temperature sensor in there. Um, I'm guessing this is actually to this little pouch is to insulate the whole thing maybe so that when these do go over temperature, the heat gets transferred to that uh, thermistor or whatever that is 
in order for it to more accurately detect an overheat condition, which would presumably cut everything out. Uh, exactly the same thing there. I'm guessing there's one of these on live, neutral, and ground. Yep, there's a third one, so that's most probably the arrangement. You know what, I'll, t I'll let you take a look, because like I said, I mean, not really the uh, point of, of this, but there's a big choke there. Uh, overall, it looks like it's got a lot of components. They didn't cheap out on this module. I mean, if they cheaped out on it, there'd just be a few metal oxide varistors, and that would be that. Um, this actually has quite a bit going on here. So I'll take a couple of good photos and put them up right now. You can pause, your, uh, you can pause the video if you really want to take a close look. This is being posted in 4K, so if you have the ability to view 4K, uh, do that to get the most detail possible. Um, the switch slash breaker comes right off the live connection, so when that's off, it's actually shutting off this entire module, which is a good thing. That's what you want to see. And, um, yeah, otherwise, the ground wire, grounding wire comes in from the cord, comes straight around to this bus bar, jumps off that bus bar back onto the surge suppression module and uh, possibly RF filtering module. I mean, like I said, there's a lot going on there. And then it continues to get jumped off this bus bar to the central one, then to this one, and then the phone comes off of this one, and the coax cable protection comes off of this one. So everything basically comes off this bus bar. As far as the neutral goes, the neutral comes in from the cord, as does the live, come off the switch onto this board. The neutral comes off the board to the central bus bar and also splits off. It actually doesn't split off, it's actually brazed. Uh, that's not soldered, that's brazed onto the bus bar. Um, and then comes across to this one. And then the neutral, as you can see, jumps a little bit across to there. So again, everything, all the neutral uh, wiring is running off this bus bar. And same with the live, very similar situation where you have a small jumper going from that bus bar to this one. And uh, actually, I spoke too soon. That's interesting. The central bus bar is, comes right off this board, as the, and the outer one comes off the board, but in two different spots. But it looks like they're just common together right through this track, which is actually kind of interesting in that the tracks on this circuit board are going to support the full load that's coming through this. I mean, Belkin's a relatively reputable brand. So I'm assuming that they size these tracks correctly. In fact, it looks like the main track that carries the uh, hot connection or the live connection is a little bit beefed up with maybe some extra solder float on top of it. And uh, these solder pads certainly have a lot of solder on them for really solid connection. So I'm liable to give them the benefit of the doubt that this board is properly rated for 15 amps. I certainly hope it is because all the current's flowing through well, if you plug everything on this side of the power strip, all the current's flowing through this track right here. So let's hope that track is uh, sized properly. Although, to be honest, not too much bad. It's not going to be too bad because if this track goes over current, it's really just going to blow off the board or just kind of disconnect like a fuse. It's probably not going to cause a fire or anything catastrophic. So not really much to worry about there from a safety perspective. Um, so ultimately, my, ver my verdict on this, without uh, having really gone into this in detail, but this definitely looks like a quality surge suppression module. I've seen a lot of uh, cheap, shitty ones, and this does not look like a cheap, shitty one. Um, I'll let you be the judge, but I think you're really spending your money here on this module, and I think it's probably worth it. Um, I don't know so much about, this, about these uh, surge suppressors on the end. I never really use these, so to me it's not a concern. And like I said, otherwise the, connect, the uh, quality in here looks like a low quality power strip as far as these bus bars go. This metal though feels a little bit thicker, a little bit heavier, a little, just a little bit higher quality than this metal. So uh, definitely a more quality product than what you get on your little $6 uh, surge suppressor. This also looks like it has better cable strain relief, which is not something you really talk about too often, but if this cable were to loosen and were to start pulling on connections in there, you could end up with a live conductor flopping around, shorting to neutral, shorting to other components. And, you know, it might not be terribly good. It could result in intermittent connections and possibly fire. So you want really good strain relief, and this seems to have it because it really pinches into the cable at three separate points very tightly. And you can see it goes all the way around, you have contact which is definitely what you want to see. I didn't address that on this power strip, but this one you can see 
a bit chintzier. It's got these two screws holding down the, the cable with decent compression, but I'm betting that if I take this off, we're not quite gonna see as much uh, impinging on the cable and as much surface area contact. I mean, it's certainly not as wide as the contact in the Belkin. You see it's hitting three spots. It's got three little indents, but they're a lot closer together than the Belkin, and on the bottom, there's really not much in the way of friction there. It's fairly smooth. Um, it's got a couple little indents there, but overall it looks like the Belkin would hold its cable a lot better than this cheap uh, non-branded one. All right, and finally a look. Now let's see what kind of mess I made here actually. So yeah, we got all this stuff here. So finally the Furman. So this also has a little electronic module, which I'm afraid I'm not gonna be able to show you because as you can see, it's soldered directly onto this switch slash circuit breaker on the front, and that only pulls out the front. It can't pull out the other way. So I would have to desolder all three of these connections in order to take this off. And uh, to be honest with you, I don't want to risk ruining this because it is fairly expensive. Um, but as you can see, it's definitely not as elaborate as a circuit board and definitely doesn't have as many components as on the Belkin. And this promises EMI, RFI, and surge suppression. I mean, from what it looks like on here, it's got a very small capacitor. It's the day after I shot that first part of this video. And I realized I don't think I said enough bad things about the Furman. It's not so much the lack of surge suppression or spike protection or whatever. I mean, I, I wanted to desolder this board to show it to you. I really did. But um, I don't really have a soldering iron that can compete with these high mass joints. So uh, desoldering wasn't really working and I, I didn't want to spend a, you know, an hour trying to do it just to have this thing end up uh, melting the switch or something else happening to it that's unsavory. But I looked uh, in the sides here as much as I could and there's really only two major components to this. There's this small capacitor right there, which is probably just for um, high frequency noise filtering. And there's an inductor. I believe that's an inductor. The package is completely unlabeled, but it's white. And uh, that's usually the type of package for inductors, um, which will help a little bit with filtering. But uh, it says surge suppression. I mean, there's a couple of thermal fuses in there, but other than that, I don't see anything that's gonna suppress uh, surges really in this. Um, unless the inductor overheats in the thermal cutout uh, kicks in. And the rest of these solder pads here, the small ones, are just to drive the LED. Not really much to it, so I think the front of this is writing checks that this can't really cache. Um, you know, because this has a big choke on it, a bunch of, uh, well, three metal oxide varistors. I am not sure at all. I looked everywhere on the internet for these uh, components right here. They look like metal oxide varistors. They're being used in an application that metal oxide varistors would be used. So if anyone knows exactly what these are and what their specs are, um, I'm curious to know. But, uh, and those are thermal fuses in between them, so if they overheat, it'll completely cut out. That's nice. There's also a capacitor in here, um, I'm assuming for high frequency filtering. So again, this, this uh, is a cheaper unit and doesn't claim anything except surge suppression, whereas this claims EMI, RFI, and surge, which it doesn't say, it doesn't actually say prevention or suppression. It just says EMI, RFI, and surge. So maybe it's just gonna be there when you get those things and not help too much with them. I mean, help a little bit, but the real reason I wanted to revisit this was because of these receptacles. Now, if you saw my last video about PDUs, I remarked on the really nice receptacles inside that CyberPower PDU. These are kind of the opposite of those in quality. Now, first of all, I looked for a brand name, and the brand name on these is Ron, Rong Feng. Rong Feng. Um, not a brand I've heard of. I can't say whether they make quality components or not, but there you go. Now, these are something I also talked about in the last video. These are backstab style receptacles, meaning that you just stick a wire into these holes, and there's a little pin that or plate that holds it and keeps it from popping out and also provides a connection. They're notoriously bad. I mean, the problem with these is that over time that can loosen up, particularly with the movement of the receptacles. And it seems to me that in a power strip or power bar like this, 
that's more likely to happen than in household wiring because these are presumably going to be used a lot and there is some flex to them. See? So as you're plugging things in and pulling them out, there is going to be some flex which is going to, you know, push and pull against these wires and possibly loosen up those connections over time. Uh, and a poor connection could mean overheating and possibly fire. Now another sign that these are cheap ass flimsy receptacles is the fact they don't have a full yoke on the back. In fact, they don't have a yoke at all. And so I brought these receptacles here to just show you what the difference is quality wise. So this right here is the cheapest of all of them. This probably costs a dollar or less than a dollar at Home Depot or Lowe's. And you can see first of all, there's no screw terminals. Let's look at it here. There's no screw terminals on the sides. It only has backstab connections. In other words, just like these. You push the wire in and hope it doesn't pull out or get loose. Very cheap, very flimsy, um, just physically not very sturdy, very lightweight, there's not much to it. Absolute bare bones, cheapest style receptacle. Now a step up from that would be this guy, which actually has backstab connections, but also screw terminals, which provide a much better, more reliable, long lasting connection. The only downside to screw terminals is it takes a little longer to install than backstabs because these you just strip the wire, you shove them in the back, and you're done. These you actually have to strip the wire, bend it around the screw terminal, tighten the screw, and uh, well, when you're doing, let's say, hundreds of these on a, on a large building project, that can add up to a lot of time. So these are not only cheaper to buy, but cheaper to put in. But cheap is not always good. In fact, it's hardly ever good when it comes to electrical installations and products. Now, the next step up, this is a 20 amp receptacle, but a 50, because it has that extra little slot there, a 15 amp receptacle of this quality would be the same basic construction. This one has a full metal yoke along the back. That does a couple of things. It makes the receptacle more sturdier in general because it's not just plastic. Um, leaves it less liable to crack or to bend or any of any sort of uh, undesirable stuff like that happen. Now, the other benefit is here's the grounding screw and the grounding screw connects to the yoke and you can see there's a path for current all the way around the receptacle to both of these, uh, to both of these plates. And this one also has a tab on here made of copper or brass, not really sure, looks like brass actually, which is used to get continuity from the grounding of the yoke to a front plate, a metal plate that would go on the front of this, which would be particularly uh, common in commercial applications. You don't see metal plates too much in residential anymore. Now a step up from this guy is this one, also 20 amp, also full yoke on the back, but this is a commercial grade receptacle. It's made of a little bit better plastic, um, a little less likely to, act to break, and just generally overall a more solidly made unit. One thing that this one has that the commercial one does not, and some commercial ones do, don't take this as a generalization, but this one also has back wire connections, but these are not the same as the backstab connections. These, like I said, there's just a little metal tab that holds the wire in and provides continuity. These actually have uh, compression terminals, so when you put the wire in, you still have to tighten the screw down and it brings two metal plates together to clamp onto the screw. That's a very good connection. That's something you would want to use. And uh, that's something that these receptacles in the Furman power strip are lacking. These use the backstab style connections. One other thing that's not too pleasing about this is that it says use solid copper wire only. Now, when you're wiring things uh, from an electrical code perspective, you have to use every device as the manufacturer intends and specifies. So if the manufacturer says this is only to be used with copper wire, you should only use this with copper wire. It also says solid copper. And that's fine on most of these connections because these are solid copper wires. 14 gauge, perfectly suitable for 15 amps that this thing's rated for. But where that falls down is with these leads coming from the surge EMI RFI suppression board. These are stranded wires, so not suitable for use in these devices. Not only are they stranded wires, but they're also soldered, they're tinned. So they're not strictly speaking copper wires, which these require. The wire underneath the tinning is probably copper, although I haven't actually checked that for sure. But at any rate, it's not a copper to copper connection. 
you're basically putting in a lead and tin or whatever kind of solder they used wire into here. I just reckon that if this does heat up and the solder comes off, that will not be a solid connection, nor will it anymore be uh, any kind of solid wire. It'll just be stranded wire, which these, I don't think we'll get a very good connection onto. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but in any case, uh, they're not using these receptacles in accordance with the manufacturer's specifications, which is kind of a concern in the first place. Now again, to reference my previous video about the CyberPower PDU, one great thing about that was that not only did they bond the chassis to ground, but they also had another jumper going to the cover plate, bonding that to ground. A very good touch of quality. If we look at the back plate for the Furman, you can see there's no jumper for this. And this is also enamel coated metal. The enamel acts as an insulator. So when you put this cover on and you tighten the screws into these holes, you're not necessarily getting any metal on metal contact between the actual body of the unit and this cover plate. It's just a lack of quality that uh, we saw in the cyber power unit, but not in this. So yeah, that's pretty much the end of my rant. Um, yeah, it just doesn't seem like you're getting your money's worth. The only good thing about this is that it has a nice metal chassis, but the receptacles seem cheap. The protection on it seems cheap. Uh, yeah, overall, not a great design. The Belkin seems like it has much better protection. If this was a metal enclosure um, with high quality receptacles, I mean, this would absolutely be the winner of any simple surge suppressor, simple surge suppressor competition. Um, this isn't, this doesn't provide advanced line filtering or any kind of stuff like that, but uh, it has a lot more going for it than the Furman. So anyway, that's my augmentation to my rant. Uh, now back to the actual thing, where I'll provide an ending that's unsuitable. So in conclusion, I mean, there's, there's a surprising amount to power strips. I've always had like kind of a thing for power strips. I don't know how to describe it. Not a sexual thing, not anything weird like that, but uh, sort of just a, uh, an affinity for them ever since I was a little kid because I loved wiring stuff together. These are like the ultimate way to wire stuff together, at least electrically. Uh, I have quite a few of these in my basement. In fact, that's how I was able to pull this one out of my ass, um, just happenstantially. Uh, yeah, I got, uh... One, two, three, four, five! What are you doing? Six, seven, you trying eight, to go nine, nine, ten! What is he nine, doing? Twelve! You'll never 13, get anything this way! Fourteen! Fifteen! Sixteen! Right. Seventeen! Oh, eighteen! Sorry, nineteen! Twenty seconds! Uh, 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 uh. Yes! A whole bunch. So I hope this was helpful to someone. I mean, it was really just more for fun to look inside these because I just bought these uh, these two guys. Well, not this one, literally, but one very similar to it. And for my own curiosity, I wanted to see what was inside and uh, share it with you. So uh, thanks for watching. Uh, fucking thing. Hang on. Feel free to make your own determination and assessment. Um, I'm not doing this for money, so if you don't subscribe... Fuck, why can I not end the goddamn video correctly? Shit! You know, more fun to look at. Uh, yeah, I think I said thanks for watching, but thanks for watching. And I could be wrong, so. I feel better about myself, but thumbs up, thumbs down, really. I mean, it's not. I prefer thumbs up. Fine, I'm right? Off my uh, back. How am I uh, looking on levels? Yeah. I have absolutely no financial interest whatsoever in it's saying gonna, this is a good product. This is a good product. Really just whatever pops into my head. Uh, stay tuned for that. Subscribe or don't. Um, hopefully, I'll have something more interesting to cover in my next video, which is why I'm showing this to you so you can. Right, Squeak Mouse? Uh, with that, uh, otherwise, as I move, my neck's going to hit it. Okay, so this should be... F Which I guess is a good thing as far as me, like, reviewing stuff and looking at stuff, because...